genteel society ladies who compare notes on their husbands' suicides, a hilariously foul-mouthed black drag queen, a voodoo priestess who works her roots in a graveyard at midnight, a morose inventor who owns a bottle of poison powerful enough to kill everyone in town, a prominent antiques dealer who hangs a Nazi flag from the window to disrupt the shooting of a movie, and a redneck gigolo whose conquests describe him as a walking streak of sex. These are some of the real residents of Savannah, Georgia, a city whose eccentric moors are unerringly observed and whose dirty linen is gleefully aired in this utterly irresistible book. At once a true crime murder story and a hugely entertaining and deliciously perverse travelogue, Midnight in a Garden of Good and Evil is as bracing and intoxicating as half a dozen mint juleps. Juleps? Hilips? Today is a book review. Hello, my name is Ian Kirk Cake, and today we're talking about John Berent's Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And yes, I did just look at the book on my desk because I still purchase books. Now from that back cover, you would think, this sounds so exciting, at least somewhat exciting. There are all these eccentric characters. From the back of that book, what is Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil actually about? It is a true crime that follows kind of Jim Williams. Some outsider from New York comes in to, to do uh, some stuff in, in Savannah and just kind of gets to know the neighborhood, gets really interested in the local characters and stays longer and meets all of these people. The central action revolves around a narrator who's observing this story of murder between Jim Williams, an antiques dealer in town, and his tryst with local male prostitute, male <laughs> Danny Hansford. Uh, eventually, Danny Hansford is eccentric in the way that he is very aggressive, doing drugs, kind of steps on the gas and almost gets the narrator killed at some point from breaking breaking the rules and um between the relationship between Jim and Danny Jim eventually shoots Danny because Danny loses his crap as it is considered in the book and Jim is accused of murder there are a total of four trials in which the fourth trial ends with an acquittal after the judge finally agrees to a change of venue to move the case for, away from the Savannah jury pool. Everybody in Savannah knew Jim too well, and then they just, it, it was a whole mess. It was a mess of a thing. The book describes Williams' versions of the killing, which is that it was in self-defense, the result of Hansford, who was prone to fits of rage, shooting at Williams with a gun that is on display, and Williams shooting back in self-defense and not murder, premeditated or otherwise, by Williams to death occurred in Williams' house. And the book highlights many of the notable savannah residents as well including lady shibliss a local transgender woman who that it mentioned on the back as a drag queen but she's actually um on hormones while also doing drag in local clubs and yeah i would call to start off this is a true crime, and the interesting, the most interesting about this book is that it is nonfiction, but it's written like a fictional novel, and you'll forget that you're reading nonfiction as you read through it. It is very interesting how this is a nonfiction work written like a novel. The second big thing to really take away from this novel is that the the central character is Savannah, Georgia. It's not any of the people, it's Savannah, Georgia, and there are a lot of interesting people inside of Savannah, Georgia, but with all of these mentions kind of at the, the back of the book, you kind of get the feeling that a lot of those people are more important than they really are. But some of them are just said in passing, including there's a person in there who is still walking his dog, even though the dog has died. And so he's just, you know, kind of jogging along the normal path that he did with an empty leash and then pretending that he's with his dog because it's part of a routine. Now, you've got all of these interesting ideas and interesting characters but at the end of the day, I didn't care about any of the people in it. And I don't have to care, like I don't have to like them, but they have to be interesting in some way. And none of them really 
were to me. And, oh, it hurts it so much more. It didn't necessarily have to be this bad, but I absolutely hated, hated Chebles. And I don't mean to talk about that as a person. I mean to talk about Chebles as a character in this book, how she was presented. And she was probably my least liked thing about this book. And why? Because she was egotistical. She was venomous. She was nasty. And there is this whole thing that I take away often from drag performances in particular that is venomous toward women. There's a por portion in there when Shebliss is with some white guy, and it's very important because she's a black transgender with this like perfect specimen of a, of a white guy is pretty much how it describes it. And he takes her home to his parents who are super racist. And eventually the guy's mom asks her if she's pregnant. And she says, cause she thinks that she's been discovered as being trans. And so she starts laughing and eventually she says yes and does it does say that she's pregnant in order to get money from the parents because the parents want an abortion because they don't want a mixed race child. And so she takes the money and runs off and goes and buys a new TV with her boyfriend. And then they go back to the house again sometime later, pretending that they're pregnant again to get more money. And there's just like this really gross charade that always plays on the worst parts of um, femininity or female personality that always tends to come out, that often tends to come out when drag is involved. And that's what I felt like Chaplis was doing, was playing up a lot of the worst perspectives the worst personality quirks, the worst things about a woman. Um, you're first introduced to Chablis. So most of this is just going to be saying how I hated Chablis because Chablis showed up so much in the book. And I'm like, why do you keep ruining the action with this person? Chablis first shows up when the narrator is driving around in his car and she's on the side of the road kind of looks like a prostitute I think she's leaving the hormone clinic because she just got her hormone shots and she pretty much demands a ride home because she goes I well, like after getting my hormone shots I turn into a bitch uh so can you drive me home and so then for some reason this guy just goes total beta and just lets this woman lets this person boss him around of course, immediately once she gets in the car, they're talking and she's already saying, well, you know, I've got a dick and you want me to show it to you. And I think there, I think that's some joking going on in there, but it's also always so vulgar that there's... N it's not really necessary and certain types of people always sort of tread on the more vulgar side. And that just does not make me like them necessarily. They got to have something going for them. So they get back to her place and a couple other times, you know, there's stuff like I got to get back to my place to have sex with my boyfriend before I turn into a bitch because that's how I basically apologize for being a bitch after I get shots. And for most of the book, whenever she shows up in the narrator's area, it's usually messing up something that the narrator is doing. Like the narrator gets invited to the... Um, black society's debutante ball or their equivalent of it it's like the night before the the neighborhood's debutante ball and they call it something else and um he he tells Chablis that he's been invited to it to go and you know experience it at and write about it and Chablis is like well you should take me and he goes well I I can't because this is a high society event and you don't really dress or act like you should to go to be able to go to those things and she's like okay fine and she gets really really angry of course and eventually actually shows up uninvited and then starts threatening people hitting like threatening the narrator that she's going to out the narrator for being crude you know super embarrassed the narrator say that the narrator is the reason why she's there because the narrator invited her and so she's being disruptive of this whole event she's hitting on the dates for the debutantes she's being vulgar on the dance floor and she's more or less just messing up this whole thing and then at the end of the night anyway she basically tells the showrunner that the narrator invited her as she's on her way out you know just just to put the nail in the final coffin there and uh assert her power and so there's just 
there's just nothing positive for me to take away from Shabliss. I hated that character. I hated how egocentric she was. I hated how nasty she was. I hated how she... <sighs> and she showed up the most, almost, out of anything. The, the second half of the book was mostly about Jim Williams and the trials, but eventually after he got arrested the first time, it was mostly he was in jail, and then every couple of chapters they would bring back up the trial as the next trial happened, or Jim Morris tried to or Jim Williams tried to do something. <laughs> if you're really interested in Georgia or Savannah history, this might really interest you because the I would call the central character the city of Savannah because then you get to know all of these very quirky people that have always just kind of been there. But for the most part, the characters were all really annoying. The narrator, there wasn't really a, uh, a personality there. The narrator was just a window for you to experience the city of Savannah. Which I don't necessarily mind that in a story. But there has to be something redeemable about the characters. And as weird as they were, there was nothing that made me want to... As, as interesting or different as they were, there was nothing that really made me want to see more of any of them. Because it was like, here's kind of a quirky thing about them. Okay, now after that initial quirk, what else is there? There's nothing. There's not really a moral code that I'm interested in. There's not really any moral code whatsoever. There's not really a softness to any of them. There's not... And they're not, like, bad enough for me to really... You, you don't get into their heads. Like, obviously, I like, bad, I like to understand bad people get into bad people's heads. Because I like to know what makes people do what they do. But in this, there's just, you know, you kind of see them doing stuff, but you never really get into the, the why. Because, again, you're a third person. You're an outsider looking in at these events happening. And you're just kind of relaying what happened. The book is fairly fast paced, though it that, though it being nonfiction, it can have it can be exposition heavy. If you're writing something nonfiction, I think that it's worth reading just so you can see how somebody wrote a nonfiction in the form of a novel. But otherwise, I didn't really like it. I can't think of anybody in that story that I wanted to know more about. That's another thing with it making Savannah the, kind of a central character is that everybody in Savannah was sort of a facet of Savannah's personality. So you got introduced to a lot of people. But that also means you didn't really bond with a lot of people. But, you know, as a robot, I don't really bond with people very easily. I just kind of suck up the information. I just suck up people trying to know them better. So let me know, have you read this book? There is also a movie of it. Have you seen the movie? Let me know what you thought of Midnight and the Garden of Good and Evil in the comments down below. If you'd like more book reviews or book discussions, like sh or share this video, subscribe to my channel, leave me suggestions for books down below because I do look in the comments for suggestions. And, um, I hope to hear from you soon. See you next time. Bye-bye.